Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we are based here in the UK, all times are in BST. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 14th to the 20th of October. I'm Ezzy Pearson, the magazine's features editor, and I'm joined on the podcast today by Mary McIntyre. Hello, Mary. Hi, Ezzy. So, Mary, what do we have coming up in this week's Night Sky? Another busy week with lots to see, so we've got plenty of planets on show to look for. The biggest supermoon of the year. Some stars of the Pleiades are going to play hide-and-seek with the moon, and hopefully... A naked eye comet plus debris from two other comets will be visible in our night sky. Ooh, sounds like a lot to be getting on with. Yes, so much going on at the moment. So I'm going to start off with the planets. Venus is in the evening sky, moving from Libra into Scorpius. It sets at about 7.10 p.m. So although that's an hour and 10 minutes after the sun, it is still going to be struggling against the brightness in the twilight sky. So you're probably going to need binoculars to see it this week. But it is there and it's going to get better over the coming weeks. Saturn is in Aquarius this week, visible as soon as it gets dark, about 17 degrees above the southeast horizon. It sets at about 3.30 in the morning. And on the 14th of October, it's just half a degree from the moon. So that will be a nice pairing to look out for. Saturn has some interesting things to look out for up close. On the 18th of October at 9.30, there is a shadow transit of Saturn's moon Rhea. So that's a second largest moon of Saturn. So all of the big moons will produce shadow transits and that's one that should be visible with a a good sized telescope. And on the 19th of October at 7.23 p.m., Titan is just seven arc seconds below Saturn's south pole. So that's incredibly close to the planet. So if you do look at the planet with a telescope or big binoculars, you should just see what looks like a star just below the south pole. And that is Titan, Saturn's largest moon. Neptune is to the upper left of Saturn in the evening sky, so it lies below Pisces. It's about 15 and a half degrees above the east-southeast as soon as it gets dark. Through the night, it's going to move towards the upper left of Saturn and it's going to set about an hour and a half after Saturn does, so you'll have a bit longer to spot it. It is going to be around mag plus 7.8, so binoculars or a telescope are needed. Its moon Triton is mag plus 13.4, and with a large telescope, you should be able to observe that continuing orbiting in a clockwise direction. We talked about that last week, so that's still going to be visible this week as well. Jupiter is the brightest planet to see this week. It lies in Taurus, so we've got plenty of chance to see it through the night. It's mag minus 2.3, so it's unmissable, being the brightest thing in that part of the sky apart from the moon. So that's awesome. It's rising about 8.40 and then it's visible all through the night. Interestingly, the star N Tauri is really close to Jupiter all week, and it's going to be less than half a degree away on the 20th. So if you look at Jupiter through binoculars, you will see the Galilean moons, but you will also see what looks like an extra moon. And that is that star within Taurus, very, very close to the planet. So that should be easy to see. Mars is in Gemini this week, so that is rising in the northeast at around quarter to 11 at night, then remains visible all night long. It's my plus 0.4 so it's still easily visible with the naked eye and you may see the reddish color of Mars when you observe it. Uranus is about five and a half degrees to the lower right of the Pleiades this week rising about 7 15 p.m as it gets dark then remains visible all night long. That is brighter than Neptune so it's at mag plus 5.7 but you will still need binoculars or a telescope to observe it. Finally, the most challenging of the planets, the dwarf planet Pluto, is currently at mag 14.5, so definitely a challenge. It lies between Capricornus and Sagittarius this week. It reaches its highest point at 7.30pm when it's only 15 degrees above the southern horizon. It's going to set at about 11.30, so we're going to start losing Pluto. So we are in the kind of last couple of weeks of really having a chance of seeing it before it gets too low and lost in the twilight. 
twilight. Mercury is also lost in the twilight this week, so we can't observe Mercury, unfortunately. But all the other planets are visible. Yeah, so definitely try and get Pluto if you haven't already. And we'll just have to wait a bit longer for Mercury to come back. It will be back. They always are. Yeah, they always come back. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on to the moon. The moon is going from a waxing gibbous through to a waning gibbous this week. And we have a full moon on the 17th of October, which I'll talk about in a second. But on the 14th of October at 7pm, Saturn is just 53 arc minutes above the moon. So that's incredibly close. Then at 10.15pm, it's going to be one and a half degrees to the right of the moon. So it always just demonstrates how the moon and the planets are moving at a different rate and the way that the sky rotates rotates means that planets can whip from one side to the other in quite a short space of time actually so it's always fun to see the different distance between the planet and the moon when you do observe it over a few hours. I always forget just how fast the moon moves across the night sky until you've got something like that when you can see it relative to something else that's remaining. I was about to say pretty static. Saturn is also moving across the night sky but In relative terms, the moon's moving a lot faster and just the reminder of that is quite striking. I had a stark reminder of that when I was photographing the lunar occultation of Saturn last month. Boy, that happened fast. It was just, yeah. take a quick video, blink, and it was gone. Like I was more aware for the egress afterwards because I'd missed ingress because it just all (laughs) happened too quickly. On the 17th of October... Technically, at 12.26pm, we have a perigee full moon. And because the moon's orbit is not a perfect circle, it is oval. There are times in the month when the moon is closer to us. And when it reaches the closest point during a full moon, people like to refer to it as a supermoon. And because it does appear about 30% brighter and about 12% larger in diameter. That difference is not easy to perceive with the naked eye, but you can definitely see a difference in diameter telescope maybe the brightness but what tends to happen is people go out and watch it rising and because of the moon illusion the supermoon always looks massive when in actual fact the moon is the same size when it rises as it is when it's at its highest point but it's always fun to observe moon rises yeah so the moon illusion there that mary mentioned that is when the moon is closer to the horizon our brains sort of interpret it as being bigger. If you actually hold up your thumb to it, your thumb will perfectly cover the moon when it's at the horizon. And then if you do it again, when it's much higher in the sky, you can see it's the exact same size. It's just the way that our brains interpret things because you've got something to compare it to that's closer and that kind of thing, which is a fascinating psychological effect to look at. It is. And I like to photograph the moon rising behind trees that are like two miles away, three miles away, because then the moon is the same size as a massive tree on your camera sensor. And when you crop that image, the moon just looks like this enormous big orb, which is how people do those really creative moonshots. They're really striking moonshots. They photograph the moon rising behind a folly and they are positioned miles away from it. And it gives you that wonderful illusion in photograph form. If you photograph the moon rising against a tree in your garden, the moon's tiny next to the tree. So it's just about the angles really. And when you see it rising against a distant object your brain it's like i know how big a tree is oh my gosh the moon is the same size as it and yeah it's fun to do it every moonrise and moonset is the same and it's the same with constellations actually constellations look massive when they're near the horizon so it is an interesting quirk of the human brain but if you was interested in how far the moon is going to be away on that night it's 357,367 so its average is about 380,000 I and mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's a kind of very small difference really when you break the numbers down so it's still a long way away but it is its closest of the year for that supermoon so definitely go and watch that a couple of nights later we have a 91 percent waning gibbous moon is going to occult some of the stars in the southern part of the pleiades some of those stars technically are naked eye visible but with a gibbous moon nearby the glare of that is probably going to make it difficult to see that naked eye but if you have binoculars you will be able to watch those stars disappear behind the moon and reappear again because as we said the moon's moving at a different speed to the stars so you can see some stars go away and then come out and then another star will go away and come out again and you can just watch that throughout that evening so yeah binoculars are going to be better to observe that really but it is always fun watching a cluster disappear behind the moon even if it is just the southern part of that cluster 
And finally, on the 20th of October at 11 p.m., the moon is going to be just seven degrees above Jupiter. So another close pairing with the moon and a planet there. Moving on to Comet A3 Susinshan Atlas, Southern Hemisphere observers have been getting a really nice view of this comet and it's going to reach its closest approach to Earth this week, the very beginning of this week. So it's going to start off the week very low down in the West, but it's going to climb higher and higher through the week. And there are some actually really nice conjunctions with this comet. So if it has survived and we're getting a good show, maybe a naked eye visible comet, maybe about mag minus too. Its tail could be up to 15 degrees long or more. We really don't know what it will do. But on the 14th of October, it's going to be only six degrees above the western horizon. But the next day, it's moved up three degrees. So it's climbing higher in the sky every day. As it does that, it's going to fade. But because it's getting higher, it's going to be easier to see because it's not lost in the murky stuff that you get really low to the horizon. But on the 15th of October, it's a really good time to try to find this comet because it's going to be just 1.2 degrees above Comet 13P Olbers. Wow. So that is a, going to probably be around Mag 11. So you are going to need a telescope to spot that. But two comets in the same field of view is always really special. But if that wasn't good enough, it's only going to be 1.5 degrees below M5 globular cluster and just to the lower right are a pair of interacting galaxies. So if you've got a kind of small refractor with a good field of view, you're going to have a lot of objects in that field of view. That is going to be pretty spectacular kind of group of conjunctions to have that comet nearby. Yeah. And if it does put on the show we're hoping for, that's going to be a pretty awesome sight. So I am looking forward to seeing the pictures that come from that one. I think there's some really good astrophoto opportunity there so Definitely. hopefully if anybody's listening to that if you do get out there and you manage to capture any of that going on please do send in those pictures to contact us at skyatnightmagazine.com we've got a link down below about how you can submit your pictures because we print the best ones in the magazine but yes we're very much looking forward to seeing those yeah, good stuff. So we also have the Orionids meteor shower this week. So it's active technically from the 14th of October till the end of October. The peak is usually overnight around the 20th to 23rd. It's got quite a broad peak because the debris stream has spread out quite a lot. So we don't have a sharp peak like we get with some. This is actually debris from Comet 1P Halley. So the press always say, see Halley's Comet tonight when you won't see Halley's Comet. You'll see debris from Halley's Comet burning up in the atmosphere. There's a very important word missing from that sentence. <laughs> yes. So the zenith hourly rate is around about 25, which doesn't translate to a huge number of meteors. So the best visual rate is usually about eight to nine an hour, but I'm happy with that. I love meteors of all kinds and frequencies. We may see a bit less because we do have a gibbous moon in the way and the radiant is rising at about 10 p.m. and the rates are going to really pick up in the third week of October. As with all meteor showers, the dawn sky is the best time to see them because the dawn side of Earth is facing the debris stream, so we get more meteors. That's the case with all meteor showers. After midnight, before dawn is definitely the best time to observe that. Orionids are extremely fast. So we talked about the southern Taurids last week, which I'm going to talk about again in a second. But Orionids are moving at 67 kilometers per second. So they are incredibly fast, 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 fast. Like when you see them, you blink and they're gone. So they're always very different in character to the Taurids that you may see at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's always interesting the different colors and the different speeds and characteristics that different meteor debris has it's fascinating to dig into because it's definitely you notice when i think of a shooting star i do think of like the fast ones as a shooting star as opposed to like a meteor that's like one of those fast ones and then you've got those i've been lucky enough to see one fireball as it happened to have been going past whilst i was driving down the motorway and that seemed to move so slowly it took me a minute to work out what it was that i was seeing because it was moving so slowly and that's one of the things i love about meteor showers is the more that you see of them and the more that you look you get to see this entire breadth of different things that are out there and because of the composition of the comet that left the debris is different each time the colors that they burn up in the atmosphere can be different so persids are often very green other showers may be more likely to be red or orange celestial fireworks it's always good fun 
the northern and southern taurids meteor shower is also active this month it's not as active as the orionids this is debris from comet 2p enk and that has split itself into two distinct separate debris streams so we have the northern and the southern taurids so the peak of the southern taurids was actually on the 9th 10th of october but the northern taurids doesn't peak until the 12th of november and the zenith hourly rate for those is only around 10 but with no moon interference we should get the maximum rate from those showers some years we get enhancement because of the torrid swarm, which is a kind of more dense part of the debris field. So it's always worth observing the torrids because you never quite know if you're going to get a surprise and get a few more very bright fireballs in amongst all the usual meteor shower stuff. And as always, before dawn, definitely the best time to look for those. So that's everything for this week. Sounds like we've got some really great things to see this week. Remember, if you want to keep up to date with all of the latest goings on in the night sky, do subscribe to the Star Diary podcast. But to summarise this week again, Mercury remains out of sight, but the rest of the planets are still on show. The best will be Jupiter, which remains close to star Entauri throughout the week, which will appear to give it a fifth moon, while Saturn will also be visible with several of its moons. The moon goes from waxing gibbous to waning gibbous with a full moon happening on the 17th of October. And that will be the biggest full moon of the year. On the 19th of October, you'll also get the chance to see the moon occulting several of the stars in the Pleiades star cluster. Comet A3 Susinshan Atlas continues to be a really promising comet and it should be getting higher in the sky every day. On the 15th, it will be near to Comet Olbers and will also be near two interacting galaxies as well for a great photo opportunity. And finally, the Orionids meteor shower runs from the 14th to the 31st of October, peaking around the 20th to the 23rd of October. And also the northern and southern Taurids continue as well. So lots of great things to see in the night sky. And we hope to see you back next week for even more stargazing highlights. Goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Thank you.